All right, you can hear me all right now? Yeah. Yep. You. Awesome. All right. Well, hey there. Uh, I'm Nevin Bengtson. I'm a code poet and founder of The Aliverse. Uh, many thanks to uh, Daniel and Laurel for inviting me to speak at this wonderful conference because um, I'm used to being on stage to talk about iOS development uh, and being up here to talk about VR uh, is new to me. It's a really exciting personal milestone so I'm really happy to be here and I'm really excited to have all of you here listening so thanks for that. Um, so. Oh yeah, so my team and I uh, are building a metaverse platform called Aliverse. In short, we're trying to create the spatial open web. So that's a future for the internet where we build our communities in three dimensions and we do so with tools from all over the web, not in locked in walled gardens. So we want to create collaborative workspaces uh, virtual places where you can work, teach, and play together. So our principles are open by design, collaborative by design, and the standard for spatial user interface design. And to understand what these three mean, um, let me give you some background. And we'll do uh, questions afterwards. So uh, the background I want to talk about is the failure of productive multi-touch and VR. So I've, I've been an iOS developer for uh, well over a decade and I worked at Spotify first building large parts of their initial iPhone and iPad apps and I went on to found Lookback, a UX research platform with customers such as Facebook and Etsy. And I chose iOS as my career because I knew in uh, 2004 or whenever it was when I watched Jeff Hahn present his uh, FTIR multi-touch prototype computer that multi-touch would be the future of computing. Everybody would use their fingertips instead of mice to interact with computers because um, it means we can use our hands to directly manipulate what we're working with instead of through abstractions like the mouse and keyboard. So while it's true that everybody carries around a multi-touch smartphone nowadays, the multi-touch revolution didn't really impact professional computer usage. So I was personally particularly disillusioned by the iPad Pro and its utter inability to provide intuitive apps for professionals that are nice to use in real life. So I started looking to VR and AR for that, you know, super intuitive direct manipulation computing platform that I had dreamed of and which I knew would change computers forever. So VR, right? It's, it's awesome. But uh, doing productive work in VR is uh, also hard. Apps are in here all designed to be all encompassing, taking over your entire virtual universe. And so working with two apps at the same time side by side is nearly impossible. And, you know, switching apps can take minutes. Adding to that, Every app reinvents spatial computing and has its own interface and interaction patterns and mappings of controls and so on. Uh, and, you know, it, when you're working collaboratively on like a, a computer, like on a com computer monitor, you can just call over your uh, colleague and you can work together on that screen pretty easily, but you can't do that in VR. So the only way to really do collaborative VR with uh, network support, like network connectivity, and that's still really unusual in VR and uncommon because it's really hard. So I started thinking, you know, what if you could create your own little virtual place uh, and then start your apps into that space together with you? And maybe then you could also invite your friends, right? 
uh, your colleagues and students into that same space. So I started looking to social VR to see if anybody was having the same ideas um, on how to build this uh, collaborative workspace. But they all seem to be taking inspiration from Facebook on how to architect software platforms. And that thing that's a pet peeve of mine is closed platforms and wall gardens. Because the platform mandates what and how to build for it. So say you gather a class in VR chat or a rec room and you want to teach them a mathematical concept using a simple in-world game, you'd have to build such a thing inside of, say, Rec Room, using only the tools and capabilities Rec Room have anticipated you need. And I say Rec Room because it's one of the only ones you can actually extend that way. And so it is really limiting. And the result is that uh, every education app that also wants social capabilities, um, or most of them have to sort of, they have to be built natively and then you have to reinvent everything, all the spatial interaction patterns, the network code, the voice communication and all that. So based on these limitations, uh, we get back to the principles of the Oliver's. So I was dissatisfied with this situation and in 2017 I started designing the Oliver's as seemingly just another social VR platform but it had a really important distinction that set it apart from the other ones. And that's in the Aliverse, users and apps can join virtual worlds on the same terms. And let me restate that. So software running anywhere on the internet can, if given permission, join the same virtual space as you. And you both have the same ability to interact with each other and other people and other things in the space. And I know that this concept and, and the implications of it can be a bit difficult to grasp at first because I've explained it hundreds of times by now and the most common reaction is a blank stare. And it took me years to reach this point as well. So I figured, uh, let me try some visualizations and uh, compare it to normal web browsing and see if, it, if it's more intuitive after that. So here's uh, how most everybody is doing it. So on the left, these EQ animals are and that's you with your VR headset, right? So on your headset, you open up Allspace, and what you're doing is Allspace connects to Allspace's servers. So this big fluffy cloud here, that's uh, Allspace's part of the internet, their cloud, and the boxes are their servers. So opening Allspace and joining their servers, that's similar to how you would just, you know, you would go to a website and you end up at that website. So, ev but every Allspace world and Allspace event and avatar those are stored in Altspace's database. It's theirs and it's loaned to you. So if you want to do something with Altspace, it must be something that their world simulation and database is capable of, right? And this is very similar to how using, say, Facebook works. Every photo, status and like belongs to Facebook and you go there to facebook.com to view them, right? And Facebook decides what content you can post and every innovation on that network is done by Facebook's developers. So let's contrast that to how the Eliverse does it. Um, the Eliverse provides spaces on our own server, so the, this middle cloud here can now be uh, our servers at Eliverse, but it's open source. Anybody can set up their own Eliverse place on their own servers if they want to. So the middle cloud could belong to anyone. And this part is more akin to good old personal blogging. Anybody could set up their own blog and not Facebook nor anyone else can say what or how you put things on it, right? It belongs to you. And um, I'll explain the rest of this diagram with an example. Um, say we want to go to this time, let's say Nevin's classroom. We tap a link in the Quest web browser and we end up in the Oliver's place called Nevin's classroom, right? Like before. This time it's empty and we want a whiteboard in there. So we tap a link again in the Quest web browser and for a whiteboard app. And instead of going to a web, web page or going to a different place or space or virtual environment, that whiteboard appears in Nevin's classroom with us. 
And so maybe we want to teach something about the solar system when we found a simulation app for that and we launch it and it too appears in the space uh, next to the whiteboard. And now we can invite our students, voila, and they're in our classroom and class begins. So here's the kicker, not only are places like websites, apps are as well. So these apps don't have to exist on your quest. They don't have to exist on Aliverse's servers either. Anybody on the internet can write an Aliverse app just like anybody could build a website. Uh, so on the left, you're connecting to the Aliverse sites and we got our uh, web server or our servers here. And then on the right here, completely different parts of the internet. So this whiteboard app and this solar system app, those are running somewhere else. They're not on the Oliver servers. So this, hopefully these, the principles now make sense and you'll understand how that makes it as different from anything else on the market. So the first principle was distributed and open by design. And that means no single company can own the Aliverse, just like no single company can own the web. And also, Aliverse de defines the low-level protocols and APIs as open standards, so anybody could build to them, and anybody with the know-how know -how could even build their own headset app, just like anybody could theoretically build, build their own web browser. Uh, just need some water. It is very difficult to drink water in VR. <laughs> um, you need to get all right. So, <laughs> yeah, I should have one of those. <laughs> well, let, let's head over to the to the second um, principle, which was collaborative by design. So, any application built for the Aliverse becomes usable by multiple people at the same time in that virtual spatial environment. You don't have to do anything special to make it collaborative. And in fact, you can't write an Aliverse app that isn't collaborative. You know, like if you have a physical object in the real world, like a whiteboard, it is automatically collaborative. You can pick up a pen and work together on it with the your friend and there's nothing stopping you because it's right in front of you. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to sign up for anything. Um, so for the third principle, that's a standard for social spatial interaction and experience design. And so that's Aliverse defines human interface guidelines that all app developers should adhere to uh, when designing their apps so that when you learn one app, all other apps feel intuitive and natural. Um, so, the thing you're probably asking uh, at this point is, what would the field of education look like in the Aliverse? Well, as educators, uh, you probably know the trials of loading up the right software for a class, right? Perhaps you're choosing from a dozen different social VR apps, uh, like this conference, to find the one that fits whatever you're trying to teach in that specific class. Um, and that means you have to know them all well enough to switch maybe multiple times a day. And uh, maybe you're finding uh, that your favorite new educational app that you found on the Oculus store or something is single user. So if you want to teach that in a remo remote environment, your uh, students would have to switch back and forth between the social app and the education app. So with the Aliverse, we really want to enable you to do all of your VR education in a single virtual room and headset app, no matter what the material you're teaching is or the requirements of this specific class and regardless if it's local or remote. So to restate those principles in terms of benefits to you as educators, uh, I started out with open by design and for you that means that you're not locked into a single platform. If a vendor, you know, hikes prices or shuts down, you only have to replace that one component. Say you had a note-taking app and that was an Aliverse app, or uh, you, the vendor you're using as your virtual class, you're renting your virtual classroom from, you can just replace that one component rather than replacing your entire teaching suite. And, and that should be as easy as just switching web browsers. And since it's all a standard rather than an app owned by a single developer, there's a whole community of developers 
that are making educational tools for you. And finally, if you have uh, developers in-house or on contract, they can build new tools and apps for you without any contract or deal with Alvarez the corporation because it's an open standard. You just build to it. You can just build it. And finally, collaborative by design means that in Alvarez, any education app or tool you find is always multi-user and can be taken into the virtual classroom with you. And this means all your VR education is social and your students can work on it uh, on these virtual tools and together and talk about it in real time. And finally, any education app you find will be using the same interaction patterns and work the same way. Uh, with a set of common design guidelines and standards, every app uses buttons and gestures the same way, you scroll the same way, you click confirm the same way, and so on. So using a new app feels consistent and intuitive and easy because, you know, it works like every other app. And so UX doesn't become a roadblock to learning. The user experience of educational app doesn't become a roadblock, roadblock to the actual learn teaching you're there to do. All right, so enough with the principles. Let's see how you would actually use Alivers in a regular uh, classroom. So in a local uh, classroom, our go-to headset right now is the Oculus Quest. So say a teacher and students all have quests and you want to have a, a VR class, you do something like this. So before the class, you would go to the Oliver's website and rent a virtual place to use as your classroom or some other place renting out servers for you. And you'd open that up in your Quest and from the Quest web browser, you could find apps that you want to use such as, you know, the whiteboard app, a math tutoring app or whatever, and click the links in the web browser so they show up in your classroom. And then during class, you can use something like Grove Learning, which is an amazing tool, and I deeply recommend to open the same classroom URL on all the headsets in the classroom at the same time uh, so that your students join the same virtual space as you immediately. And now you can teach your class in VR using the math tutoring uh, app or whatever and other virtual tools you find together with your students in VR. And a remote classroom isn't really that different. It's the only difference is how you get your uh, students into the room. Maybe you just email that uh, uh, URL to your students or and they click it and they join the room when they're ready. And then you and your students can really be anywhere in the world and still learn together in the same virtual classroom. And this works just as well whether you teach uh, school class or you're a freelancer looking to teach clients. Uh, say you're a music teacher and you find uh, Alivers Piano app, you could do piano tutoring in VR. Just set them a calendar invite with the Alivers place in it uh, instead of a physical location and off you go, right? Or say you're a design freelancer and you just finished a project, you want to educate the team on uh, the new design system you built. Bring your designs into a shared web browser in uh, Alivers Place. Uh, design that virtual space, maybe with some canvases, brainstorming tools, and stuff like that. And then invite your team with a URL, and off you go. And similarly, at a larger corporation, you might even have developers in-house. And in this case, you could build your own teaching tools. Bring them into VR with Alivers and teach your employees in VR instead of flying them halfway across the world. Which I think is pretty great. So all that sounds lovely, but uh, you know, what does reality look like? Um, fact is, we're, we're, we're just getting started. We have a long way to go. We got head and hand movement in there. We got some voice communication, some low level APIs. But we still need a, a lot, like avatars, asset, asset pipeline, some way to distribute apps, and so on. Um, I figured I'd show you a GIF. I'm, it's not much yet, but there's a, a, a lot that has built to make this possible. Uh, here we have two users in VR, and you can see you can see hands and faces, and you can actually talk. Not you can't hear that in a GIF, of course, but they can actually talk to each other. That's about it so far. 
because uh, although Aloeverse is open source and has been developing since 2018, we incorporated Aloeverse AB only this January 2020. And now we're a team of six people who are ramping up development from hobby and side project to full-time job. Um, those six people are these wonderful creatures. It's uh, me, Tobias, Emma, uh, and Patrick that write the code to make this happen. Uh, Julie down here is the CEO and steers the ship, make sure we get to market. And uh, Eleanor down there, make sure that it's all functional and pretty. So this is the second startup I founded and I'm, I'm really proud of the people that come together and the culture we form together. Because we're doing this because it's enriching to do something good for the world while at the same time applying our passions. And we're not doing this to get rich. Uh, our, our primary, like our primary value is that everybody is happy and doing this out of joy rather than uh, pushing people to be the most productive. And I think that's really important uh, in company culture to build something nice together. Um, yeah, I think that's great. <laughs> so, um, so we got these six people, but we also need you people to build this beautiful future we're envisioning. We, we would really love your support. We want you to join us on this journey because we're so early in development. Uh, so your opinions and ideas have a great chance to get incorporated. So primarily we want to hear from you, you educators, we want you to tell us what you need this platform to be capable of so we can build it for you. Uh, there's an email in the next slide, please reach out. There's also a public Slack, just come up, talk to me afterwards. Um, beyond that, we're also looking for our first bleeding edge customers, you know, the, the ones that are willing to pay for early software to really shape its future. And maybe that's your organization. Uh, if you're a developer, uh, we'd love to get your feedback on our APIs and we'd love to see your apps on our platform. We'd gladly promote it and feature it even within the app so people see it immediately. That'd be really cool. And finally, we don't want to do the whole VC thing where we want to build something sustainable. But it'd be really nice to have some initial funding so we can go from part time to full time. We're working 50% starting. Uh, in one week, actually. Um, so that initial funding would be nice to get. So if you <laughs> happen to be an angel investor or work with grants or something like that, and this future entices you, we'd love to hear from you. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And please email us at info at .com. Check out our beautiful website. Sign up for a newsletter if you want to hear more. And I really hope I get to hear from you and even to see you in the Aliverse. James, thanks for listening. And uh, I guess we can open up for questions. Okay, I'll just mm -hmm. uh, give everyone the hand raise feature. Uh, everyone has it. Okay, so can you hear me in that space? Okay, so we have. Uh, Marcia again, Marcia, have you got a question? Let's see if we can get Marcia's microphone working. I struggled last time. <laughs> right, where are you, Marcia? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. yep. Hello? Yep. Oh, hi. Marcia. Well, I'll be getting in touch with you because I like to identify um, grants. I'm sorry, I think, I don't know if that's my background. I apologize. <laughs> I'm still new to this. Um, no worries. I identify grants, and there are so many grants um, um, that I think will apply to this. And as you said, mm. it doesn't have to be focused on, you know, digitization or um, just training and development, rehabilitation, for example, um, prisoners who are about to transition to the outside world, they might use this. Um, you know, and I can identify different grants and maybe we can coax the prison systems, you understand, um, into using that. And not only prison, I mean, it's, it's just, as you said, it's got such a realm of possibilities. Every private or industry, public or federal, has a training and development program. 
And this is not going anywhere. First time I heard about this, it was in 2006 when I was studying my master's degree and they called it the internet two, where the classroom (laughs) comes to you. And it's great that um, you guys are pioneers and that you're opening doors to all of us in order for us to be your voice everywhere we go. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. We we really want to build. We're, we want to. There's so much you can do with this technology, but we we're all all six of us are really passionate about education in all its forms. We really want to build tools for specifically that. We have applied for a uh, Swedish state uh, grant, uh, Vinova, for example, uh, stuff like that. But I'd love to hear, hear about more. That's a great way to get kickstart this without you know getting VC money involved. So I appreciate really appreciate that. <laughs> Let's keep in touch. Thanks. Okay, right. Uh, we have Thomas now has a question. I believe. Thomas, if you're there, let me just get your megaphone on if we can. Okay, there you go. You should be able to speak now, Thomas. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Thomas. Great. Hey, how's it going? Um, thanks Great. so much for that presentation. Uh, the Alloverse is fantastic, and I can imagine projects similar to Alloverse being kicked off by people maybe all around the world right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm a design, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm a design educator. I teach interaction design here in Vancouver, Canada. Um, mm. And um, a lot of what I do is to do with prototyping. And I can I can imagine your project evolving. And I'm wondering um, if if you have methods around prototyping um, in terms of like low fidelity or high fidelity prototyping. So do you make smaller incremental steps? How does Alibers evolve? And how can we evolve it? Does it happen like with with more? I mean, is it is it getting into the digital tools right away, or or can we start with um, conversations? I think the the conversation is starting now. I'm I'm a hardcore developer myself. I like to build things okay. with code and see how that feels. Uh, that's not gonna scale. So. Um, I've, I've started some design documents uh, to start to make those that, that standard that I talked about, but there is uh, so much to explore and I, that, that's part of the reason why it's open source. I really want input on, or we want, really want input on how do we design this in a way that's intuitive, that, that still doesn't make it feel like we, we lose all um, innovation but make something really nice and easy to use and i haven't used a lot of prototyping tools in vr so i'm i'm right. about to explore that so if you want to reach out and send me some some links i'd, I'd love that I, I i've seen market i'd love to try that out i haven't done it yet sure i guess yeah i guess i'm just wondering you know i've seen Oliver's now you presented it to me and i'm a designer and i know how to evolve projects like this do i just mm. kind of start doing it on my own and kind of show it to you or do you have a oh. way of collaborating we have a public slack i'd love you on there so uh, cool. okay. yeah just uh, email me or reach out to me afterwards now I'll, I'll get you in definitely thanks thanks yeah Anyone else? Right, let me uh, just have a look, see if we've got any other questions at the moment. We have Sharp C, I believe. Sharp C, let me just put your megaphone on for you. And you should have the megaphone on now. Hey, Sharp C. Sharp C, can you hear us? I think that might have been on, been on since the last session. <laughs> Let's have a look. Uh, hold up, I don't think his megaphone's on. Let me try one more time. Oh, okay. Unless he's turned it off. Shop C, do you have a question? Uh, I had it a second, and now I lost your sound. Oh, um, all right. Well, okay, we can hear you me now. Um, he's really quiet. I, I wanted oh, to come over. comment about... Uh, Am I the only one not hearing him? I've just switched. His megaphone keeps switching off. I'm not sure what's happening there. Uh, It should. uh, Yep, it's just turned itself off again. So that I'm not sure if uh, I'm not sure if he can hear us either. So I'm just going to message him and let him know. (laughs) Okay. Ah, technology, huh? 
Why? Yeah, why we're, am I, we're still I, trying to figure it out, but we're it's a, continu- a continual <laughs> yeah. state of progress with all technology. It's fine. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's it. I'm I'm not sure why I'm a programmer, given how much it it really all of it sucks, but it's still so much fun building for it. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of hate it but love it. That's, that's <laughs> exactly. It. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Right. One second. Let's see if we can get this mic working. Right, saying your megaphone's on, Sharp C. And if you can hear us, can you try and speak again? Okay. Perhaps oh. connection issues there then. Sharp C has gone. Let's see if we've got any other questions lined up. No? I think that was it. If anyone has any questions, do you want to raise your yeah. hand? We'll or we can just uh, we can just turn off uh, audience yeah, mute well, and we can yeah. we can meet down here and uh, talk if you want to chat further. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Please stay and chat for a while. Uh, really appreciate having having an audience here. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Everyone's mics are open, so if you want to speak, feel free. Yeah. But uh, let's give some love. Let's give some love. Emojis, <laughs> Thanks for that. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Turn off the stream.